Hello and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Quite often here on the show, we talk about corn, soybeans, and wheat. Well, today we're going to talk about a couple of other crops, alfalfa and lentils, and discuss herbicide options in each of those crops. Hey, I wanted to talk about soybeans a little bit because there are a lot of diseases that came up in 2019 that farmers are still asking about today. And you may be wondering for your farm, if I had one of these more unusual or less likely diseases in my soybean fields last year, will I have to worry about them again this year? We'll discuss that on this show. Well, we've got a super common weed of the week coming up later in the show and an iron talk as well. But first, here's our farm basics. You spend all year working hard to get as much yield as possible at harvest. The last thing you want to do is put your grain in the bin and have it spoil before you take it to market. Introducing the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. Designed and built by a farmer looking for a low-cost monitoring solution for existing bins, the Grain Temp Guard tracks temperature and humidity with an alarm system to alert you when your grain exceeds safe thresholds. For more information on a system for your bins, visit farmshopmfg.com. Open our show each week, we have what we call our Farm Basics Time, where we'll take something that is commonly used or done in agriculture and try to explain it so even if you're a non-farmer, you can understand what we're talking about. Well, today our subject is, what is a lift station? We often talk about drainage on our farm and getting good oxygen levels down in our soil. This is really important and it's a little bit more difficult, especially in really flat or very low lying ground to keep that water table down and to keep two or three feet of the soil profile where you've got 25% oxygen in the soil. That's what we need for microbes and for healthy roots. All right, so here's what ends up happening with all these tile lines that end up running below ground to add more oxygen to the soil. If they're so low that the water can't get out, well, then you have a problem. So what farmers will do is put in what we call lift stations. So they'll basically dig a hole in the ground and have something there. Maybe it's a tank, maybe it's a big pipe, something down in the ground, and then they'll pump water out from that. So in effect, it's really just a sump pump for a field, just like you would have a sump pump in your basement. That's exactly the best description I can give for a lift station. Think about it like a sump pump, because look at your house. You've got tile lines or drainage lines, just like farmers have in their fields. That's what you have around the foundation of your house, and it all slopes down so the water runs downhill, right? Well, it gets to your sump pump, which is basically a tank that you're gonna pump water out. Now, out in fields for farmers, this is larger areas, of course, than just right around one house but certainly for farmers so the pumps it's a little bit bigger yeah it's, it's a bigger <laughs> pump and and here's the challenge for farmers is just wrapping their minds around how much water is really going to move so when you think about an inch of rainfall on a field well you don't think oh that's not very much water right it's only one inch but it's one inch over everything that's 27,000 gallons per one acre, which is about the size of a football field. So if your field was the size of a football field, you now have 27,000 gallons of water that either your crop is going to use or you're gonna to have to pump it out. So with these lift stations, farmers will basically figure out, okay, how much tile is running into this pump and how big do I need to size that pump? And a lot of times what farmers get worried about is, well, how much is it gonna cost to run my sump pump for my field all year long? Well, what we found on our farm, if it's gonna run all year long on a per acre basis, we're probably gonna spend 20 or $30, but maybe it's only five or $10 most years when the pump barely runs. And again, keep in mind, we are in a drier area of the country. Last couple of years, we've had record rainfall, but that's only been about 40 total inches of annual precipitation usually we get 20 to 22. Now you may be wondering okay if they're pumping this water out how clean is the water well again anytime we're doing subsurface drainage tile pipes just like the pipes around your house the water has to go down through the soil which is a natural filter and the water coming out is often drinking water quality. The only problem with great drainage is, yes, it will help your crop, but it will also, unfortunately, help you produce more weeds like our Weed of the Week. We'll tell you how to stop it on your farm coming up later in the show. 
This is a seed bag. This bag is made of craft paper with a cellophane liner and provides nothing for seed growth. This is a seed bed. It was prepared with Case IH soil management tools. It optimizes everything from nutrient access to water infiltration to create the perfect environment for early uniform emergence. Get to know why your seed bed drives productivity at caseih.com slash soil management. The Guardian Air Twin Spray Nozzle from Hypro produces a twin spray pattern with air inducted droplets for superior coverage, even in dense canopies. Be effective and efficient with your spray application this season with the Guardian Air Twin. Hypro, helping you spray better. Introducing the all new Diamant Cornhead from Capello USA. With a revolutionary design highly innovative for its class, we have painstakingly designed every component down to the smallest detail to maximize your harvest efficiency. This gives you unprecedented standards in operation and performance. For more information about this beast, available only in our new gray poly, call 855-CAPELLO or visit capellousa.com to find a dealer near you. Capello, wherever you are, we are. Find love, and then give it all away. Find love, then give it all away. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. 2019 was a terrible year for diseases in soybeans. We've spent a lot of time talking about sclerotinia, white mold, sudden death syndrome, and a few other diseases. But today we want to get to some of the less common ones. Darren has spent a lot of time out in soybean fields here in the last few years. So Darren, I'm just going to quiz you quick. Let's start with Phomopsis. All right, first of all, I haven't just spent time in soybean fields the last few years. I've spent time in soybean fields my whole life. And oftentimes you see throughout the season different stages of some of these diseases we're going to talk about. So when you talk about that whole diaporth family of diseases, Phomopsis being part of that, I think of pod and stem blight. Now, there's a couple different things here because you can see late in the season when you have warm and wet conditions, more disease pop up on soybean plants, especially during reproduction, and then as they get to the end of the year and they start to senesce. With this particular one, pot and stem blight, we see the stem blight portion having little black specks that happen in lines up and down the stems and out onto the pods. Now it often gets confused with anthracnose and other diseases. With anthracnose, this is one we saw a lot of in 2019 black blotches on the stems. And this is another one of those conditions where we get moisture late in the season that we're gonna see more anthracnose. When it comes to pod and stem blight and phomopsis, yes, seed treatment can help a little bit, but mainly what we're really after is fungicide use later on in the year. I would suggest starting at R1 and spraying every two to three weeks until pretty late in the season, even up to R5, maybe even early R6. You know, with anthracnose, there just isn't anything that's really good on anthracnose. So we look at varietal tolerance, but again, this is one of those things that generally pops up so late in the season, we don't see a big impact on yield. If it does pop up earlier though, it certainly can reduce your yield in your fields. All right, let's talk about brown stem rot. Where do you see it most commonly? How do you get it under control? Brown stem rot is more common in the north, so we normally see this in the northern corn belt. Now, brown stem rot looks a lot like sudden death syndrome when it expresses foliar symptomology, but inside that stem, we're gonna see a brown pith. So that's really the way that you know you've got brown stem rot rather than SDS. It likes cool and wet conditions. Okay, the other thing with brown stem rot, I would just strongly encourage you try to pick tolerant varieties if you've got a lot of issue there. Well, there are resistant varieties too for brown stem rot. So this is one that you can actually 
completely negate out in your field by picking the right variety. All right, let's get to charcoal root rot. What do you think there? You know, charcoal root rot's one that can be pretty much anywhere. And what we'll see is down towards the lower part of the stem, we'll see some little hard black sclerotia that kind of look like that little black speckling. When you scrape off the outer layer of skin on the soybean stem, you'll often see a charcoal color. And this is a disease that likes hot and dry. So it's a little bit different than some of the other diseases. And it's more common when you have cyst nematode problems. And also it's more common when you have heavy soybean aphid pressure. At least that's been my observation. Right, so try to raise a good, healthy crop, and usually you have a lot less charcoal root rot. All right, let's get to Cercospora. Well, Cercospora is one that, that we see as well. A lot of times you'll see kind of a leathery appearance on soybean leaves. This is one that fungicides can really help us on, but just like in sugar beets and other crops that have been fighting Cercospora, we've got to use multiple effective modes of action if we want to do the best job controlling this particular disease. And also rotation, crop rotation helps uh, because we see this over winter in the residue, just like most of the other diseases that we've talked about. All right, the last one I've got is not a fungal disease, so fungicides won't control it. It's tobacco ring spot virus. We saw this again in 2019, and we pretty much see it every year, where you see just one green plant out in the field here and there. And we'll see it oftentimes mature so much later. It'll have a lot of pods in many cases, but they just never make seed. Uh, this is caused by some sort of vector, whether it's a thrip or something moving that from plant to plant out in the field or from field to field. Haven't ever seen this be such a big problem that it caused any issues in the field. Yeah, so again, we're talking about good insect control, and then you'll have fewer diseases in the field. Well, again, this is just a basic summary on a few of the less common soybean diseases we saw this last year. Do everything you can to raise a healthy crop. In most cases, use good seed treatment, and spray some fungicide later in the year and you should see a lot less of these diseases. And for more information on all of these diseases and more, just download the free Ag PhD Soybean Diseases app that we put together with the American Phytopathological Society. Great information, great pictures, uh, and a lot more details too. Well, we've talked a lot about disease control, but we're gonna get to weed control later in the show. Can you identify this week's weed? There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target it's no secret that Mother Nature doesn't always cooperate with your schedule. Field conditions in recent years kept many from timely planting and fertilizing. And when you can't get your fertilizer applied, you lose thousands of dollars in yield potential. If you need flexibility in your fertility application timing, you need a drop tube system from CNR Supply. CNR drop tubes allow you to apply liquid nitrogen in season and place it exactly where your crop needs it. To learn more about low cost CNR drop tube solutions, visit crsupply.com. Do you feel like there's never enough time to get everything done before planting? The window for spring work is quick and unforgiving. Give yourself the upper hand with the ProTail High Performance High Speed Disc. More and more farmers agree the ProTail is the right tool for spring field conditions and heavy residue management. Zero maintenance bearings, independent disc technology, oversized pins and bushings allow the ProTail to handle whatever field or conditions you can throw at it. Degelman High Performance Equipment. Avoid dry run failures with the new Hypro Force Field Pump. Providing the ultimate protection, this wet seal pump will save you on costly in-season downtime to keep your sprayer running. Now all you have to worry about is the weather. Hypro, helping you spray better. Challenging field conditions often make harvest difficult. Can your corn head handle it? The GTS X10 corn head from Agra US is a rugged, cost-effective alternative to heavier, more traditional heads. Constructed of durable yet lightweight aluminum, the X10 puts less strain on your combine without losing harvest effectiveness. And it is 40% lighter than traditional heads, reducing field compaction in those less than ideal conditions. For more information, give us a call at 8334-AGRA US. Where we have run the Soil Warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. Now, 
I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. Their ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the soil warrior. Well, you may have noticed that it is now snowing. This is a, a first for us filming Ag PhD shows to be out in the snow. But you know, when you're talking about a late spring application of soil applied products, this may be just the right weather to get things going. Hey, yeah, I don't have any problem if we apply our herbicide and then we get snow on it. So it's certainly not bad. All right, we're gonna talk a little about weed control in alfalfa and lentils. And unfortunately, the common theme that we have here is you don't have many choices for post-emerge control. So do everything you can to get weeds under control pre. Fortunately, there are multiple effective modes of action that can be used pre in lentils because post-emerge we don't have a whole lot of choices. So when you think about putting down one of the yellow products like Prowl, for example, that's a great way to start for grass control, but it also adds small seeded broadleaf control to the mix. There are other choices that can get even more small seeded broadleaf control like Metribuzin and Sharpen as well. And you can also use the active ingredient metolachlor. So you've got four different modes of action that could potentially be used pre-emerge. Hey, don't forget about pursuit as well. So there are five different ones that you could use. The thing is you might not want to use that pursuit pre because if you have clear field lentils, you actually could use beyond. Same chemical family as pursuit. You don't want to double up on those. You're going to have a carryover issue. The other thing that I would make a comment on here is for the pre-emerge herbicides, low rates are kind of the standard thing. You can't use the full rate that you'd use in soybeans for Sharpen, for Prowl, even Metribuzin. and we want to be real careful because lentils are a pretty sensitive crop. Again, post-emerge beyond is really all there is for broadleaf weeds, and that's only if you have clear field lentils. Otherwise, for grass, you can certainly use Clethodim. All right, let's turn the page here and look at alfalfa because it's a little bit different. When it comes to that pre-emerge program, we've got one main product that we really like, and that's Eptam. Now, Eptam has the same active ingredient as the old eradicane that we used to use in corn, but it doesn't have the corn safener. Eptam is really good on grass species, but it also delivers a level of small seeded broadleaf control that we like too. Getting the Eptam out early is important and you have to till it in. That adds a little bit of complication, uh, but it's certainly something that can be managed on your farm. By putting the Eptam out early, we can keep that field clean and allow the alfalfa to get a thick early stand. By doing so, we often choke out much of the later season weed pressure. If we skip this step, you're gonna really struggle. And alfalfa is so expensive to seed the first time, you don't wanna to have to be ripping out a stand or having an inferior stand for several years. Over the years, a lot of people have asked me about using some trifluralin in alfalfa. You don't wanna do that because it's too hard in the alfalfa. Technically, if you sprayed it after the alfalfa had germinated, but before it emerged, it might not hurt the alfalfa too bad, but then you have to assume that you're gonna get rain like in a few hours to get that trifluralin in the ground. So our whole point here is don't do it. I know trifluralin is cheap, but just spend the money on Eptam, use a half a gallon or more on Eptam, use a full labeled rate, and you'll have real good weed control to start off the season. Now, post-emergent alfalfa, you don't have very many options. The options historically have been Bucktroll and either Pursuit or Raptor. So if you've got ALS resistant weeds, well, the Pursuit or Raptor aren't gonna do you much good. Then you're just relying on Bucktroll, which let's face it, it's got some warts to it too. It's not the best on pigweed would probably be one of the biggest things about it. The other thing with Bucktroll is it's a contact killer only. It doesn't have residual. So make sure you're using 15 gallons of water and smaller droplets to get really good coverage. All right, so Darren mentioned Pursuit of Raptor, I'd call that one. Bucktroll, that's two. The third one I talk about all the time is Buterac, but you can only use an ounce or two. That's old 2,4 dB, and yes, it will be just a little bit hard in the alfalfa, but if you're only using an ounce or two together with a Bucktroll or a Pursuit of Raptor, that definitely does help on many of the broadleaf weeds. Well, the good thing about alfalfa is you're also going to be cutting it multiple times through the year. So if you do have some weeds come through, you will be cutting some of them off. That can help a little bit, at least keep them from going to seed. 
but you don't want to rely on cutting weeds as your only control method. If you start with a good pre-emerge program like we talked about with Eptem and alfalfa, you can generally keep your alfalfa fields fairly clean for a few years. Last couple things I'll throw in here. First of all, you can use Clethodum or a number of other grass killers if you have grass in your alfalfa post-emerge. The other thing I'll say is there are some products that can be used in dormant alfalfa. I'm not big on those. Some people talk about Metribuzin or Velpar. There are a number of them. I just don't like them. I think it's too hard in the alfalfa. Personally, if I've got weeds that bad, it's time to rip the stand up, start over again. And one of the reasons that you may consider taking that alfalfa stand out is if you have our Weed of the Week. We'll show you how to stop this tough weed coming up next. The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> trying to identify our weed of the week and we're thinking what's the weed behind the dandelion because it can't be the dandelion no it is the dandelion that's our weed of the week it's a terrible weed especially when you get it in a crop like alfalfa that we were talking about earlier uh, darren when you started the segment you said the weed of the week and and i just thought of the weed of the weekend. Well, this is a weed of the weekend because usually when you're out in your lawn, it's the weekend and dandelion is the number one issue there. So today we want to talk about controlling this dandelion weed, not only in lawns, but also we were just discussing alfalfa. Personally, I think dandelion is the number one killer of alfalfa stands around the country, but we're going to show you how to stop it in both cases. Well, out in fields, dandelion has really thrived in the last couple of decades because of the great reduction in tillage that's happened across not only the United States, but in many areas around the world. When we've gone to no-till systems or even strip-till systems, we're leaving a lot of area of ground undisturbed. And just like your lawn at home or an alfalfa field, when the ground is undisturbed for a long period of time, dandelion has a chance to set in. All right, but here's the good news. So far, dandelion is not resistant or even tolerant to Roundup. It's just that it takes a really high rate because dandelion is a perennial weed. Now, granted, it's just a simple perennial, so it doesn't have rhizomes or anything, but nevertheless, you need a good, strong rate of Roundup. The most common issue we see in fields is when people are out spraying too early. And by too early, I just simply mean the plant isn't growing actively and the weather's too cold. We really want to see the daytime temp around 70 plus. We want the nighttime temp at 50 degrees plus. If that's the case, usually Roundup will control dandelions very well. And it's the same thing in the fall, Brian. If we wait too too long into the fall yep. when it starts getting cool. We want to do it early. So I know harvest is going on and you think, I don't have time. I'm gonna have to wait till after harvest. No, when you get a great day for spraying, you have to stop the combine and get some of these jobs done. Or if you are after the first frost in the fall, just go out there with a really big rate of either 2,4-D or dicamba. That works quite well too. So when I mentioned 2,4-D or dicamba, I could say the same thing in lawns. Now we don't like the use of dicamba at all in lawns, but 2,4-D, that would be just fine. Use a big rate, do it early in the spring, do it again late in the fall, and usually that'll wipe dandelions out of your lawn. Now I mentioned alfalfa earlier, the only real solution there is to plant Roundup Ready alfalfa and use Roundup in your alfalfa field. But I would also tell you, just try everything possible to raise a good healthy stand of alfalfa. It's the same thing we talk about with all crops. If you have great crop canopy, you have fewer weeds. That's all the time we have for our Weed of the Week dandelion, but Iron Talk is coming up next. There are a lot of steps to having a perfect season. Don't let your fertilizer plan be the step that trips you up. No matter when you apply fertilizer, no matter how, 
AgroLiquid has the experts and the products that'll help you move closer to your target and hit the bullseye. AgroLiquid moves you closer to your target. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt and a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. Do you feel like there's never enough time to get everything done before planting? The window for spring work is quick and unforgiving. Give yourself the upper hand with the ProTill High Performance High Speed Disc. More and more farmers agree the ProTill is the right tool for spring field conditions and heavy residue management. Zero maintenance bearings, independent disc technology, oversized pins and bushings allow the ProTill to handle whatever field or conditions you can throw at it. Degelman High Performance Equipment. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. This is a seed bag. This bag is made of craft paper with a cellophane liner and provides nothing for seed growth. This is a seed bed. It was prepared with Case IH soil management tools. It optimizes everything from nutrient access to water infiltration to create the perfect environment for early uniform emergence. Get to know why your seed bed drives productivity at caseih.com slash soil management. Inoculant application is a job you can do on your farm. We'll explain the best equipment setup for inoculant in today's Iron Talk. Inoculants are used in a number of crops to introduce nitrogen forming bacteria to legume crops. On our farm, soybeans are the legume we grow, but for you, it may be any number of legume crops. Soybean inoculant is a term for rhizobia bacteria. They colonize around soybean roots and bring nitrogen in from the air into the plant. The trick is to apply them to the seed and get them into the soil before they perish. Inoculants must be in close proximity to the main taproot of the plant to be the most effective. For this reason, seed applied treatments are most common. With inferro liquid applications, you'll likely need five times as much product to equal the results of seed treatments. We've also seen much better results when applying inoculant within hours of planting. Planting seed days or weeks later after treating the seed results in bacterial mortality of up to 90%, but bridging or clumping of seed with liquid treatments is always a concern. Best practice is to spray liquid inoculant on at multiple points in a brush auger or potentially a belt veyer or cup system. The keys are to use multiple nozzles to get improved coverage of the seed, and then to have some sort of mixing as well to coat the seed on all sides. Doing it a few hours in advance of use and running the seed through a brush auger or belt bayer after treating will greatly reduce, if not eliminate, clumping, leading to maximum performance from the inoculant and the seed. When it comes to dry inoculant, there are dry treaters on the market. The challenges have been lumpy, uneven distribution of the product on the seed and a static buildup in the poly hopper. CT applicators have the best technology that we've seen on the market with a stainless steel hopper and a sifter to even out the application. Adding inoculant to legumes like soybeans generally provides a nice return on investment. Doing it yourself is pretty simple, whether you're using a liquid or a dry inoculant. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's our time for today, but before we go, if you're looking for more agronomic information, we'd encourage you to check out the Ag PhD Insider magazine. Just go to agphdinsider.com to learn more. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.